Welcome to the session on uh, energy and geopolitics. Uh, the purpose of this session is to, we'll, the way it will go is we'll have a short presentation by uh, the three honorable guests that we have here, which I will, of course, introduce. And then we'll have a question of answer, one between ourselves as a discussion, but also from the audience. So if you want to ask a question, you can't just get up and ask a question. You have to write it down and uh, raise your hand, and that gentleman right here will uh, pick up the note and uh, give it to me. And if I can read your handwriting, then I'll try to uh, ask that question. So uh, our idea is to have as much as interactive time as we can and not to give you like a very, very long lectures. But we will start with a few lectures with outlooks on, the, on where, this, uh, where the world energy market is going. And we'll try to do it on areas that are less uh, in the news uh, or in the common, common area all the time. Our first speaker is Bob McNeely. Bob was a, a, a former special assistant to President Bush and senior director of international energy on the National Security Council. He is the founder and president of the Rapidan Group. He is a member of the National Petroleum Council and non-resident fellow at, at the Columbia University Center on Global Energy Policy. And he is one of the few people that in 2014 forecasted a decline in oil prices. That was a good one. Right. Bob, please. Thank you very much, Yossi. And I owe you $20 for that mention of my uh, price call in 2014. I am delighted to be back uh, in Israel and at the Herzliya Conference. When I began coming to Israel 10 years ago, my introduction with Mickey Altar's help was through the Herzliya Conference. It's always been a pleasure. I learned so much, and I congratulate you and the organizers. And I'm delighted to be here with my friends, Brenda and Neil, as well. I have spent most of my career, whether in the private sector or even in the White House, as a barrel counter, trying to figure out what is driving global crude oil prices. I'd like to share with you today some of the long-term trends that the consensus of barrel counters or oil analysts are seeing. But first, I think, you know, sometimes we might want to choose our words carefully. We say oil, oil, oil. But let's remember we're talking about the lifeblood of modern civilization. Oil is an essential commodity upon which our transportation systems, our agricultural systems, our defense systems, our economies, our medicines, our clothes, and everything else depends. And it is the sole uh, commodity in those systems, certainly transportation. In electricity, we have alternatives. There's gas, there's nuclear, there's coal. In transportation, there's oil. So I think sometimes we ought to not say oil and say lifeblood. Maybe that's too long and gets wordy, but I think that's helpful. There's an expression in, in the United States, and I'm sure there's uh, a Hebrew version, uh, hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. I'm going to talk about the worst that we need to prepare for. I'm going to talk about three trends that most oil analysts, me included, and other government agencies, such as the International Energy Agency, the Department of Energy in the United States, see in the coming decades in the global oil market. They are not pleasant. The first is that dependence, the world's dependence, on the Middle East and OPEC for the lifeblood of modern civilization is going to grow in the coming decades, not fall from about 42% to almost half. The second trend is that the flow of oil in the world, the main stream of oil, is going to shift from the Middle East to the West to the Middle East to the East, to Asia. And third, because OPEC and Saudi Arabia are no longer playing the supply manager or price stabilizer role, Oil prices are likely to be much more volatile in the future than they have in the past. Those are the three trends. I like to show slides and pictures, and we're going to go through some very quickly, if we can uh, mount that. 
if it's possible. If it's not, po there we go. So um, the first trend shows you, and this is from our Department of Energy's recently released oil market outlook, an energy outlook. This shows you trends in energy consumption, dividing the OECD or rich world and then the non-OECD or developing world. And I'll go very quickly, it's pretty obvious, the demand growth in Asia, the Middle East, Latin America is going to soar. Whereas our demand in the, in the OECD will remain relatively stable. Most of that demand growth, here's where it's coming from, Asia. Asia's demand is going to soar. And the Asians and the uh, Middle Easterners and the Latin Americans, turns out they like to drive. They like to drive big SUV cars. These are the fastest selling brands. They like train travel. They like plane travel. They like all the blessings. They crave all the blessings that we derive from oil. And that's happening now in Asia. So now the question is, where will we get the oil to supply this soaring demand for in Asia? Here's where. This is the components of supply. You see the uh, demand will go from about 95 million barrels a day per year to about 105, uh, or the, over 110 million barrels a day uh, in 2040. I want to draw your attention to just a few of these bars. Notice the red bar. This is United States shale oil production, a wonderful new source of supply that nobody expected 10 years ago. It is a wonderful thing for energy security, for US, the US economy, for global security, but it is not a game changer in terms of the amount of oil we need to find. At the bottom of those bars, you see some blue bars. Those show you the amount of oil, the, the blue bar at the bottom, is the amount of oil from today's fields, pumping today, that is going to decline. And the other blue bars show you oil supply from fields we either haven't found yet, we don't even know where they are, or we found them, but we haven't invested one shekel or one dollar to get the oil out. We hope, we expect, but we, haven't, we don't know precisely where that oil is coming from. Now, this shows you the world's oil supply by reserves. You see the first trillion barrels there has been consumed already. The next trillion barrels God chose to put in the Middle East primarily, the lower cost oil. As we go higher, we have more expensive oil. And there you see shale oil, that little new green bar, is the new contributor to supply, but it is expensive. Okay, this shows you who will be supplying oil in the coming decades. See the blue line I've circled there, most of it comes from OPEC. OPEC has the lion's share of the oil, the, the cheap oil, and OPEC's oil is expected to be produced mostly going forward. Now, prices. Here are projections of crude oil prices. Because of soaring demand, and because the remaining oil is more high cost, the price of oil is expected to climb to about $150 in the base case in the coming decades. You have different cases there, high oil price, low oil price, but most analysts, myself included, expect the trend for oil prices will be going up. Now here's the really scary chart. If you take OPEC will be supplying more oil and the price will be higher, then OPEC is going to earn a lot more money from its sales of oil. Just last year, OPEC's sales fell to $455 billion. That's down from almost a trillion dollars in 2012 because of the low oil price. But because of the trends I described, we have to expect that OPEC countries will be earning a lot more money up to and beyond even $2 trillion. Who in OPEC will be earning this money? Next slide. Mainly the Middle East. 
and you know uh, the countries involved there. So hopefully this has made my first point, that analysts who uh, objectively uh, analyze supply and demand expect OPEC to earn more money in the coming decades, a lot more. Next point, the flow of oil in the world. This shows you how oil supply has flowed out of the Middle East to the world in the last few decades and then going forward. You see, in the last few decades, oil principally flowed from the Middle East to West Europe and the United States. And that flow anchored US geopolitical interests in the region, very importantly. As you see going forward, that flow is going to reverse with portentous implications for geopolitics and global security. Last point, <clears throat> prices. This is a price chart showing oil prices going all the way back to the first well in 19, 18, 1859 in Pennsylvania. And what it shows you is the oil price has gone through long periods of relative stability and then long periods of wild volatility. We call this boom and bust, boom and bust. And boom and bust oil prices are intolerable for the oil industry and for governments. How can you plan defense expenditures when the price of oil gyrates wildly? How can you plan your economy? How can you buy airplanes? How can you build factories? How do you know which type of car to buy if the price of oil goes like this? So three people, three organizations through history have stepped in and attempted to stabilize the price of oil to remove the boom-bust price cycles by manipulating supply. Mr. Rockefeller, and then in the 1930s, the United States. People forget that the United States created the most effective OPEC ever. OPEC tried to copy the quotas that United States oil states implemented, Texas and Oklahoma, very, very strict. But as a consequence, OPEC is no longer able or even pretending to play this stabilizer role. As a consequence, we should expect more of what we have seen in the last 10 years, 115 to 27, 147 to 33, and then back up again. This is one of the most challenging changes in the oil market because it destabilizes economic planning, destabilizes defense planning, destabilizes countries. Look at Nigeria, look at Venezuela, look at Iraq. So these are my happy, happy points for you. Uh, I'm going to end with a shameless promotion for a book I am writing on this new era of boom-bust oil prices. Let me end by saying that while we have to uh, hope for the best and prepare for the worst, we have to address these realities with our best minds. And no country, in my view, has a greater incentive or a greater capability to address the challenges we face than Israel. Toda Raba. Thank you, Bob. Our, our next speaker is Professor Brenda Schaefer. She's a specialist in energy and foreign policy, energy security policies. Azerbaijan, the Caucasus, Caspian energy, and Eastern Mediterranean energy issues. She speaks countless number of languages that you no, don't even know exist. <laughs> she currently is, visit, is a visiting researcher at Georgian University. She's on sabbatical from the University of Haifa, where she's a professor of, in the School of Political Science. She previously served as a research director of the Caspian Studies program at Harvard University. She's also an author of a number of books including energy politics in 209. Brenda, please. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. No, no matter how many times our students will learn that oil prices work in cycles, that you know, nothing cures low oil prices like low oil prices, we, we always think that what's happening now is here to stay. And I really welcome uh, Bob's presentation. I'd like to follow up with some of the implications of these cycles uh, for, for, the, for, the, for the Middle East. Um, so what we have to remember, as much as we think that, you know, that the real crisis is these extremely low oil prices, um, what we're doing today, we've had the last two years the largest drops in the history of tracking oil and new, and new investments in, in oil production. So, so essentially when we usually, uh, we usually prepare for the future with investments, demand is going up. 
uh, around the world. At the same time, investments are going down in, in, new, in, in new oil. And as much as we really, I think there's many policymakers in Israel and in the United States that are very happy about OPEC being dead, OPEC not being uh, able to ha be an actor in, in, the, in the market, a significant actor. The meaning that OPEC is dead is meaning we have no adult supervision in the market. And there's really no one, OPEC traditionally, a positive aspect of their behavior was they planned for future demand. They wanted to keep us in the era of oil, so they planned for the demand. Well, that planning isn't taking place on the finance side, and we will see the implications for that in, 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 future, in future prices. Well, in terms of the interaction between the Middle East and the oil price, one, one observation is that oil is not as sensitive as into the, in the past to developments in the Middle East. Um, one is that in such a liquid oil market in general, uh, the price is not uh, so, so responsive to geopolitical events in, 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 at all. But speci specifically, I think because we have much more knowledge about how the specific events can or cannot affect uh, the movement or production of oil, um, the market has learned to, to not respond so much to events in the Middle East. So for instance, if you have uh, demonstrations in Egypt, potential in instability, if it's not going to affect uh, ships going through the Suez Canal, it's not going to be factored in, in, into oil. So we've seen in this, in this current period of the price cycle a lot less responsiveness to events in the Middle East being reflected in the oil price. But at the same time, I think we might be underestimating in the oil price insta potential instability in the Middle East because whether we like it or not, this is the mother load of oil. And the type of events, for instance, things that very many experts in this room on, on, on the Middle East, things that we can easily imagine, for instance, a, a, a hotter proxy war between Saudi Arabia and Iran. So the, you know, the, the, the two, two biggest producers in the region uh, suddenly using terrorism, using proxy movements to undermine each other's uh, oil industries. This is not a fantasy. This is not a dream. This is a very realistic scenario. And I think it's quite poo-pooed by most experts, most policymakers. Well, you know, Saudi Arabia and Iran aren't really going to go to war. They probably won't don't go to war, but they might, they both have a history of using terror, using militia, supporting proxies um, 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 to, un to, un to undermine uh, uh, each other. Another thing, North Africa. Um, there, most of the attacks of ISIS and other uh, militia groups there have been focused on the energy infrastructure. We should look carefully at these attacks, for instance, on the Algerian energy infrastructure, the two in the last year. Um, they, they, they've been quite successful, high number of deaths. They've been able to disable important installations. We have ports, oil ports going offline in Libya and in a regular basis. So it's enough, even if you don't have you know, a government falling, but you can have specific targets on energy infrastructure in, in North Africa. I think that's going to be something to watch. We'll, be, we'll have implications not just for the oil price, but also for gas supplies into Europe, especially with uh, Algeria being an important uh, a, a, a supplier. Um, another aspect is the chicken and the egg. Well, uh, uh, yes, um, the, the um, Middle East producers are having less, less income right now, and this can cause instability in many of the countries, and that in itself can bring to, to falls in production and that in the end can jack up the oil price. That's why it's very dynamic, and that's why people like ourselves can write books and have a career and stuff thanks to all these changes. So where do we expect the, 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 the chicken or the egg to be affected by the price and the oil price? Let's say $50 oil continues for another year, more or less around $50 oil. And, and also just to point out that we're not in an historically low oil price period. Uh, what was the exception? with 2010, 2012, which was an exceptionally high period. And actually, from most of the late 60s until today, the oil price has averaged at around $31 in today's dollar. So 50 is actually you know, re relatively uh, uh, robust. So let's say a year goes ahead of oil price projection. Well, most commonly, um, many analysts, when they try to see who's going to have economic or, or, or potential instability, they look at the gap between the, the balanced budget and the if, and, and the uh, income from anticipated from oil. It's very simplistic and doesn't really give you a, a good picture because most of the major producers have learned from the 1980s crash and they uh, they planned they plan for the cycles in the oil price and you can see that they're much better uh, 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 prepared for this low relatively low uh, part of the oil price cycle than they were in the 1980s when the crash uh, took place. So, who, so who's vulnerable? First thing, it's the most vulnerable actually are countries outside uh, the Middle East, Venezuela, Nigeria, Angola, that do not have the type of currency reserves that can allow them to, to, have the, to sustain a gap in the budget. 
Um, inside the, uh, in, and actually uh, among the non-OPEC uh, that, that have long, strong currency reserves and actually will probably be able to relatively well uh, to weather uh, the, this part of the price cycle is actually Russia, Azerbaijan, and Kazakhstan. And these are also countries that Israel has very intensive interaction and relations and uh, um, their country, their, their economy seem to be weathering this crisis better, better than most had anticipated. Um, we're in the Middle East, we should anticipate um, uh, countries to have a special difficulty in terms of the huge gap between the oil price and, and their balanced budget and having small uh, reserves would be actually Iraq and Iran, okay? And uh, this might be good news for some people in the room that it includes uh, Iran, but as much as we're talking about you know, Iran getting back uh, most of its reserves, its currency reserves and all the, all the money it has. It actually has more debt than actually the money it's about to or it's receiving, uh, it's being, being unfrozen. And um, it has entered the energy market, the oil market and gas markets, the regional gas markets as well, at the least opportune time uh, that's really possible in the, in the, in the past, in the past uh, se se seven years. Um, and so actually where you might, if we look at this same formula of uh, oil price versus balanced budget versus currency reserves. One of the more vulnerable countries to instability is, is Iran, uh, certainly Iraq, certainly also Iraqi Kurdistan, and as to a certain extent also uh, Al Al Algeria. And again, Algeria, not only important, not only a, a oil producer, but a very important gas producer, especially uh, uh, for Europe. And I think there is a lesson. There's a lesson also for Israel as Israel goes ahead and thinks about and thinks about uh, being a gas exporter. You know, prices move in cycles. You have to prepare your economy, or if you even want to be a part of that cycle, this sort of secular, most most energy producing economies are trying to delink themselves from these cycles. Do you want to be a part of these? Uh, cycles. Um, so I hope we can develop this during a uh, discussion. Thank you. Th thank you, Brenda. Our next speaker is, is Neil Brown. He's currently the Director of Policy Research at KKR Global Institute, a leading investment in energy proje projects. He serves on the board of the U.S. Extractive Industry Tra Transparency Initiative for the U.S. Department of Interior. He previously served on the, st on the senior staff of the U.S. Senate Committee of Foreign Relations on the staff of Senator Richard Lugar. As, a lead for, as the lead for international energy in the Senate, he spearheaded major laws and strategic initiative in energy security, infrastructure, and transparency. Neil, please. Do you mind if I stay seated? Is yeah. It, is it okay if I stay seated? Okay. Please you. do. Yes. Uh, UFC, thank you very much. Um, you know, you've kindly uh, introduced all of us, but let me also pay tribute to you and the innovation and uh, real leadership that you show in this area. We, we uh, at the United States, we have benefited from your, uh, uh, from your advocacy in looking for alternatives, and we appreciate that. Um, let me also thank the IDC for, for having me. It's a pleasure to be uh, in Herzliya, uh, my first time at the Herzliya conference. Um, I thought that uh, I, Brenda mentioning the chicken and egg issue reminds me that, that you're, we're nearing lunch. So I'll just share a few points and, um, and then have a, a, a conversation. Uh, we all just watched a, a, a very interesting and spirited debate on uh, Israeli gas in the, in the other room. And it reminded me a little bit of, of my time in the Senate. Um, not so much the yelling. Um, but the talking past each other. And, and so I guess the first point I want to uh, make, uh, really drawing from my uh, policy and, and political experience, uh, about 10 years in the Foreign Relations Committee in charge of uh, energy issues, is that there's not a linear relationship between geopolitics and prices, nor between prices and geopolitics. It's a two-way street, but really I, I think of it as, as more of a traffic circle or a roundabout where you have uh, you have major economic issues, uh, macro balance of trade, competitiveness. You have micro issues um, that are really social issues on the uh, ability of, of families, uh, small businesses to pay their bills. You have environmental issues, clean air and water, climate change. You have national security issues, um, um, all, all mixed together. Um, and policies need to be able to, to speak to all of them. On the national security side, uh, which I know is, is a great interest here, um, there are just a few, few aspects of it I'd like to just mention um, in, in when I think about energy in, in the national security space. I mean, one is 
um, energy uh, being manipulated, political manipulation of supply. The best example out there is Russia um, in, in uh, its activities in, in Central and Eastern Europe and, and um, Central Asia. Uh, maybe some lessons in there as, as Israel thinks about possible Russian investment in the energy sector here. Um, two is uh, physical, physical security, terrorism. Uh, Brendan mentioned this, but these, these assets are a prime target for terrorists, um, and uh, no one would, would know that uh, better than actually Saudi Arabia, um, but uh, important lessons for Israel there. Uh, conflict over resources, which we have seen in many places, but also resources funding conflict. Um, also uh, pervasive uh, in the Middle East as well as, as in Africa in particular. Uh, these resources being a source of revenue for terrorism. Um, of course, uh, Daesh um, and um, Iran. Um, and then uh, the resources, the funds, the prices, entrenching authoritarianism and some of the most hostile regimes uh, in the world. Um, so you put all that in the mixer, uh, lots of implications. I just wanted to identify two. I mean, one is that a single variable, in this case for our panel price, can have extremely diverse impacts. Um, some of them positive, some of them negative. So you know, a couple obviously positive ones, lower prices, less money to Daesh and to Iran. Those are good things. Um, another positive, increased gas demand. You know, Israel sitting on, on large reserves, increased da gas demand. Um, as, a, as a price result, and also with policy headwinds, so you're going to have a, a cleaner air, uh, a cleaner environment. Uh, but also negative, so uh, destabilizing regimes. I agree with Brenda. I'm particularly concerned about Iraq. Um, you know, they're having, uh, they don't have the reserves uh, that some of their neighbors do, and um, at a time where they need money uh, to fight, fight Daesh, uh, let alone uh, continue, try to stitch the, the society together. And of course, um, another negative, um, if you're a producer sitting on, sitting on um, new resources like Israel, increased competition for investment. The, the second point I wanted to make is um, that the, the, the low price environment we're in now is actually, it, it's fundamentally a sign of the, the markets working better, actually. Um, uh, Bob uh, touched on this. You know, we, we like to, to bash OPEC um, for many reasons. It's a good sport uh, in the U.S. Congress. But in, in reality, we rely on them uh, we, and rely on, on Saudi Arabia specifically to mani manipulate markets and to um, levelize prices to reduce volatility. We get mad when they don't do that. Um, but what we've seen is uh, in the current environment, we, the market is in oversupply. Um, it's oversupply led by the U.S. Bob mentioned it. I mean, to, to give you a sense of the increase in uh, U.S. production, in just under four years, the U.S. added the, the equivalent of Iraq to production. I mean, just think, it's, it's staggering numbers that some of it has come off because of prices, but it can come back, and it will come back, um, and which is the point Bob made about uh, the U.S. becoming the new, the new swing. At the same time, You've had this, so you have an overreaction in supply, now you're having an overreaction in response, so the correction is going too far. So uh, 2015, we saw about a 23% cut in CapEx in oil and gas around the world. This year, probably about a 26% cut. This is almost unprecedented. And um, what the implication is, well, several implications, um, starting with uh, the, the US being uh, more independent, we do have more flexibility in the Middle East, but, but let me just you know, state clearly that that does not mean we're disengaging um, from the Middle East. We, we remain as engaged um, at the, the oil, well, no, I won't get into the Obama administration policy. But in terms of energy, we have just as much interest in seeing secure flows out of the Middle East as we did when we had specific um, more, more trade with the Middle East. Um, and then we're also going to see more price volatility as, as as Bob mentioned. Third point is ga gas markets are becoming more global. They used to be regional. They still predominantly are, but now you have a competition in, in gas markets in a way that you've never seen before. To give you a sense, the, 
LNG capacity between 2015 and 2020 will surge by about 45%. That's the equivalent of adding two new cutters, the Australia and the United States, over that time period in terms of export capacity. It's huge. You're already seeing a massive price compression. European spot LNG prices down by half. East Asian down by two thirds. And it's going to take some time for this to, to, uh, to play out. Implication for Israel, there's increased competition. Um, so it's, it's gonna be more difficult to develop Leviathan. Um, if you're relying on export markets, there's more competition in export markets. It's still possible. Um, uh, my firm and others are, are very excited about the possibilities here, but it, it, you, gotta, you gotta step up your game. It, just having a good resource is not going to be sufficient. The second is that um, there, there seems to be a competition between domestic and, and external markets. Um, we, don't, we don't see that as a competition. In fact, um, we, we counsel that the, uh, Israel should do all it can to increase its domestic market. Fourth point, uh, going a little faster here, um, talking about oil and gas prices so far, that's not all the energy. Um, there's also renewables. And we've seen there's no single price point for renewables because it's so dependent on climate conditions and other factors. But the fact of the matter is renewable prices have come down dramatically. Um, to give you a sense, solar system costs just over the last six years have come down 50% for residential systems, 74% for commercial systems. They're now actually cheaper than gas in some areas. That's important. That's important for Israel. It's important for the region. Why? Israel now has a viable path if it chooses to deploy renewable power in a big way. And second is that um, your, your neighbor uh, in the region, Saudi, uh, in particular, this is essential for them. If Saudi does not reform their economy and reduce their consumption of oil, they will become a, <laughs> a net importer within our lifetime, um, quite possibly very soon. Uh, with profound implications for, for markets, let alone uh, their, their position in the economy. Last point is that um, energy is old. I mean, oil and gas, it, it's old. Like the, the technologies are old, the business models are old. It's, it's ready for disruption and you're starting to see it. Um, tech is pervading across the value chain. Some examples, um, shale made possible by big data using sensors and higher computing power to be able to see the resources and do horizontal drilling well below the, the, the surface of the earth. Understanding flows. There's a company here called Windward that um, can track uh, commodities at sea, oil on the ocean, and actually get better results in terms of predicting flows than the EIA or IEA, the, the gold standards in, in, in data. Um, System integrity. Uh, there's a, a company called Optimal Plus, we're invested in it, that does uh, semiconductor, um, uh, I'm, I'm up, um, reliability and, and security. Those semiconductors that run power supplies, even your, your vehicles. Um, efficiency and personalization. You know, last year we, or excuse me, yesterday we heard from uh, the CEO of Move It a fantastic company. I took get to get here. Probably a lot of you did as well. Managing power, the internet of things. I mean, I think I mentioned about four or five uh, Israeli startups. This is a huge opportunity for Israel. And it will, it's not just an economic opportunity. It's also an opportunity to change some of those geopolitical uh, factors that we have been talking about so far. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. People mentioned here that uh, Saudi Arabia is no longer the controlling or acting at its, in its traditional role as uh, the manager or influencer of oil, oil prices. So I'll present an hypothetical theory, or maybe it's the reality, which maybe we'll discuss a little bit, that they actually have no choice, and actually it's not that they, they elected it necessarily out of uh, choice, it's actually they can't control it anymore. And I think this is very important in the, in the, the fact that uh, we sort of think they try to bankrupt, the common sense is that they're trying to bankrupt the U.S. shale industry. I think they have no control whatsoever. Um, it, people mentioned already that Saudi Arabia uh, is dependent on oil. Saudi Arabia's largest customer is Saudi Arabia. They are now the eighth 
the sixth largest, sorry, uh, oil consumer in the world with 28 million people, and the number of people are growing. And in the summer, they are the fourth largest oil consumer in the world. Okay? And that's what, when you say they're not going to change, that's what it means. If they're not going to change and switch away from oil, they're going to be running out of their own, they're going to be the only consumer of their own oil. The second reason is that there's the, other, the, the regular consumer is no longer a European, shall we say, um, can Western countries with certain uh, behavioral morals. Their largest consumer, second largest consumer is China. And the Chinese have a way of explaining that is different than the Western world. They will not accept, shall we say, a cut in production from uh, Saudi Arabia in a way, let's say, that uh, where the Western world will accept. They will not. And they know how to explain. And that's when, uh, if you notice something a year ago, the President Xi visited both Iran and, uh, and Saudi Arabia, explained to them that their contracts cannot be cut down. The third one is that 15 years ago, Saudi Arabia realized that they don't want just to export oil. They want to actually make money on the oil as well. So they build a lot of refining capacity or invested in refining capacity worldwide. And the third largest uh, consumer of Saudi Arabia oil is Saudi Arabia refineries or where they have high investment. So again, cutting that supply there will cut even more to themselves. So the reality is there's very little left after that in the free market that Saudi Arabia can cut. And if they cut it, Nigeria will take it up in five seconds okay? because they have they are the ones who lost market share here in Saudi Arabia on their contracts. So in reality, Saudi Arabia cannot cut production. The question is, can they increase production? They haven't increased much. And what we also know is in order to increase it, they're using uh, what's called water pressure uh, technique. So that's a technique you're using. You insert water into the well, when usually when the well is in the end of its lifetime. And you can only do it for X number of years. So actually, Saudi Arabia is not in a great place like that. And therefore, even if they wanted to be the balanced producer, I don't think they could. So the question is, what will happen okay, in a world to the prices? You said volatility, but maybe we can expand it. First of all, if you don't agree with me, please say so. But second, if you can start commenting a little bit about how fast can Saudi Arabia change? Can they? What do you think is going to do to supply? What's going to do to OPEC if there's going to be an OPEC? At all? Please, feel free, whoever. Well, I might. Um, I, uh, I think you, you're exactly right. Speaker. Uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, Testing one, two. Uh, sound good? Uh, you're right, uh, Yossi. Uh, Saudi Arabia arguably hasn't played the sort of swing producer balancer role since the mid-1980s when it stopped doing so. We also really haven't needed it to until shale and Chinese demand came along to make the market unbalanced. But I want to come back to a point that Neil and I made uh, and why this is counterintuitively not a good thing. And I want to ask you to look at history and consider a religious question. And the religious question is, why did God make Texans? God made Texans for many reasons, but two reasons he made Texans. One, to find oil. They're very good at finding oil. And two, to limit the role of government, keep government out of the private sector. This is what Texans are famous for. If God made Texans to limit government and find oil, why did Texan oil industry and Texan officials create the most severe Soviet centrally planned, intrusive form of quotas ever known to man. Texas oil state officials and Oklahoma and other states, starting in 1932, regulated supply well by well, field by field, month by month for 40 years. They sent troops into the fields once to shut off the wells. This is how seriously they took supply control. Why is that? Because for the previous 20 years, we had boom-bust oil prices. It is, I think, something we have forgotten in living memory, how destabilizing 
volatile, swinging oil prices can be for everybody, except perhaps some hedge funds and people who own storage. And this, now, the Texas Railroad Commission, which used to be OPEC, it still exists. OPEC will still exist, but they no longer play the supply control role, and that is an underappreciated challenge we, we have to contend with. I think, I think your point is entirely correct. For, for OPEC, to, what we hear in every newspaper and many policymakers is OPEC had a strategy not to cut and go for market share. Right? You've, seen, you've heard that in every newspaper, right? And my question is, why do the journalists perpetrate this myth, this policymakers? In order to have a strategy, you have to have an ability. I mean, you know, it's sort of like saying, well, I'm not even there's a good metaphor connected to orgies and stuff, but I won't, but I won't use it here. But in order, to, in order to have a strategy there, you have to have the ability to participate, let, let, let's just say. And so obviously they, have, they could not cut off a, back enough that would have had an impact on the market without com, you know, completely just helping their competitors. Um, second, you know, going into your point about Saudi Arabia, you know, we always think of the, the Middle East as a very energy rich area, but it's a very electricity poor area. We have unreliable supplies in most of the countries in the Middle East, especially among our neighbors, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Egypt. If you don't have stable electricity, you can't even talk about even agriculture. If you don't have water pumps that can be, you know, receive water on a, on a regular basis, you can't talk about any prosperity or stability in the Middle East without stable electricity supplies. And where they produce stable electricity, as Yossi pointed out, they produce it mainly by oil, which is very expensive, very polluting, it's, it's unsustainable. So we have to think of a whole new way of, of producing electricity. On the question of, you know, can Saudi Arabia diversify? Well, yes, they can cut down their oil consumption. That would be easy to do, especially by just developing their natural gas and putting most of their desalination electricity on natural gas. But no oil, it's, it's a myth. Oil producers don't manage, major oil producers don't manage to diversify. Oil producers are not, are not companies nor countries are not going to go from producing oil and gas into renewable. There's no comparative advantage of a guy that drills oil into suddenly knowing how to do something in the laboratory that's going to be, you know, going to be a, a, a game changer. So the chances really of diversification are, are very small. And even in the question of uh, energy security, well, again, we like the fact that market force, it's almost an ideology to us. We love the fact that, you know, that, that market forces are taking over the, the trade of energy. And it does have some good implications, especially in oil, of pulling a lot of the politics out of it. Um, in terms of security of supply, let alone security of price, and especially when we talk about gas, the market does not always deliver the type of, does not improve security of supply. We have to think of not energy security like we think of national security. You just can't privatize it and send it to the market. You, you, need, you need proper policies in place. Neil, you want to comment? Um, just, um, yeah, just, just to add, I guess, uh, Saudi has four problems when, when it comes to whether they can swing the market. The first problem is China, uh, although the demand has shifted, uh, structurally shifted to East Asia, China's slowing. So demand is not going, um, is not increasing as fast as what they need to rebalance the market in a sustainable way. Two, is that there are probably two million barrels of production sitting on the sidelines today because of wildfires in Canada or the Delta, uh, the, the Avengers in, in the Niger Delta. There's, you know, usually we think of geopolitical shocks taking oil off the market. At the moment, we're probably looking at geopolitical shocks actually bringing oil onto the market, whether it's Nigeria or Libya or in smaller areas um, elsewhere. Um, so Saudi cuts, well, it very well may disappear, whatever impact they have. Third is Iran. We could talk some more about Iran. But if Saudi cuts, they're giving market share to Iran. This is probably not what their, their first priority is. Mm -hmm. And four, they're, they have a problem with the U.S. Um, and specifically, the problem with the U.S. is that although Saudi, the, the, um, the, the government can, can instruct Aramco to cut back on production, neither, you know, Barack Obama, nor Donald Trump, nor Hillary Clinton can tell you know, uh, Bob's Texans or North Dakotans or anyone else to do so. And so as soon as there's a price recovery, U.S. shale is back. And unfortunately for Saudi, the, uh, the drop in global prices has made U.S. shale much more uh, efficient. So its price point has come down. Um, there's a question that is also very interesting because I think it, and we heard a little bit in the previous session, all kinds of forecasts about how much natural gas we're going to have in the, in the Mediterranean, which 
I don't know. I don't know. There's another big field in the Israeli water, at least according to geological surveys I know, but I guess they found new ones. Um, but, but the issue is also the, what's happening to natural gas worldwide as a market. I think it's a, it's a very big change in terms of uh, a lot of factors, and I think the biggest factor is a complete disconnect in price. Um, it used to be until five, ten, ten years ago that the price of oil and gas per BTU followed each other. Now it is a complete disconnect, and uh, I think even when oil was at 30, the price of natural gas in the United States was a third or a sixth or even zero. Okay, almost in some places, compared in an energy basis compared to oil. The big changes on that is that that is going to probably going to stay forever because the world is awash in natural gas. For every barrel of fracking that we get out of the ground, we actually get more gas in natural gas liquid than gas. So the, there's a constant pressure on gas. All the Eastern Mediterranean is gas. It's not oil. Russia is gas. A lot of other places in uh, Central Asia. There's a whole shift of gas going to, to Asia as well, not to Europe. So we're looking at the worldwide g oversupply of gas that's going to keep prices going lower and lower. And the question is right now, what does it do to oil? I mean, those are not interchangeable markets so far. They've been very little. In Saudi Arabia, you can replace their oil. They're the largest oil consumer for electricity in the world. You can replace it with natural gas. But most of the world doesn't use oil for natural gas. So what's going to happen? Natural gas is a big energy source that Israel is supposed to be looking. There were all kinds of people say, I don't know what the price will be. It will rise again to 15 and everything like that. I'm talking about the chief of staff of the Minister of Energy. I mean, what's your outlook on gas prices over the next 10, 20, 30 years and their separation from oil? Um, well, you have to look to Bob to predict prices. Um, it's, a, it's a fool's errand, which is sorry, I'm glad we have. No, no, nobody could. Like fool. No, the, the worst thing you can do is forecast prices, but then you have to remember that of the, the 80 people that forecasted the direction of oil in, uh, in uh, 2014, two were right. So you can, you'll be in good company. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> Clearly, there is a, uh, there's going to be an oversupply of, of LNG on the market. Um, I, I, in rare cases, might there be an oversupply of piped gas? Um, that rare case, the biggest one being Russia, because they're sitting on a lot of production that they can turn up uh, very easily. But um, the, the, the glut in the LNG market, I think, is going to take at least two to three years to really, really play out. Um, but even then, you know, you have a number of, uh, you have low price gas and you have a number of uh, facilities um, waiting in the wings in the U.S., uh, more in Australia, uh, in Western Canada, ready to come in. So I, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't agree that, that we're going to see, you know, forever low priced gas. Um, you know, like, like Brenda saying that low, you know, the best cure for low oil prices is low oil prices. You're going to see the same effect in gas. But the difference is that the market is, you know, it's not even an infancy. It's, it's, it's basically still a fetus, right? Because it used to just be pipe from point A to point B and burn it, um, which is essentially what, what Israel is doing now. But, but that's not the future. Uh, in the U.S. alone, you know, we have, we have gas that's uh, less than $2. I don't know what it was yesterday, but, you know, it's been hovering around there. Um, so what's happening? Well, we're building like heck to export it to Mexico. We're building LNG exports. We're building chemical, uh, we're building chemical plant, heavy, other heavy industry. Um, we are slowly going to transportation. Um, it's, it's quite complicated in the U.S. because of the, the distance. So I think we're, we're in a, a period of market discovery um, that, you know, the, the gas will find a home, but it's going to take several years to figure out what the new e equilibrium band is. I wouldn't say price, but, but price band. Um, I'll focus my answer on Europe, actually, the European uh, gas market. So I think actually the real challenge to gas Gas uh, consumption in, in Europe is actually competition from low coal prices. It's not you know, what's happening to the oil prices, but it's actually the low coal prices. And we have some also almost perverse policy outcomes happening in Europe where with such incentives to renewables, but really no, uh, uh, but, but low, at the same time with very low coal prices, 
we're having a rise in the consumption of renewables in most markets together with a rise in the consumption of coal. And so bottom line, well, you know, you're producing more emissions, more pollution, uh, um, uh, the, the result is actually you know, far from what anyone w you know, w would have in would intended and, and you know, it's something to also be thought out in Israel. You know, here we have gas sitting in the ground and when you look at what Israel's proposal was for Paris where, where our, we were gonna cut renewables in the future, it was mainly f from renewables. Well, the easiest, you know, the easiest way is just to replace coal at a, you, you do, you know, you, almost overnight, you can, low, you can radically lower Israel's emissions, plus even more important on the day-to-day -day basis to us, lower pollution, air pollution in Israel, just by converting power, you know, power plants from coal to, 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 to natural gas, and, and you don't, it, 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 that wasn't in the, in the, in the plan. Um, also, I think in terms of delinking from oil, while well, you're seeing prices delink from oil all around uh, the globe, in Europe, I'm not so sure that they're running to do that. I think that the, you know, the, the low oil gas prices right now in Europe, that part of it has to do with the low oil price. You're not hearing the European consumers or the Russians saying, hey, let's, let's just link this. So it's something, something uh, uh, to watch. And the last thing I think, you know, going with uh, Neil's point about the uh, US LNG you know, coming, coming into this region, coming into Europe, the rhetoric in Israel has been we have to produce our gas quickly because Iranian gas, the Iranian gas is coming. It's, but actually, the competitor is nice, red, white, and blue American gas, if anything is going to change the price mechanisms in, the, in this region. Bob, want to add something? Well, just very briefly, um, I think the reason for the disconnect, the core reason that you mentioned between gas prices and oil prices was these, uh, the removal of uh, oil in space heating, electricity, uh, electricity generation, et cetera. In the early 1970s, up to 40% of oil demand in the OECD was used for these purposes. And that was all substituted with nuclear and coal and, and so forth. Uh, Saudi Arabia is atypical in that it still burns a lot of oil to keep the air conditioners running. And it is bringing on gas plants to offset that. However, globally, there's not much more of that low-hanging fruit. So as Neil said, I think you alluded to as well, Yasi, in the long term, uh, reestablishing that connection would require transportation to uh, use more gas. And whether that's done directly through natural gas vehicles or indirectly through electricity, uh, that is at best a long-term proposition. Secondly, uh, with regard to at least delinking or accelerating the delinking of natural gas prices from oil prices, which is much firmer in Asia than it is in Europe, uh, we need to keep developing uh, spot traded gas. I mean, the reason that it's like we said earlier, we, we build a pipe, an expensive pipeline. Gas, unlike oil, is very expensive to transport. And so you, uh, you have long term fixed contracts with uh, long term prices, and they're inflexible. But as we start to see more LNG gasification, uh, regasification terminals and liquefaction terminals get built, we hope to see a more what my colleague uh, Leslie Palti Gutzman, our, our gas analyst, calls the democratization of gas, where we see more spot traded uh, gas, more LNG cargoes, more spot prices. That will begin to erode and chip into the oil link uh, uh, prices, which as Brenda mentioned, are still quite, quite firm. I want to add part of the problem of the gas in the transportation sector, which you mentioned, is either through electricity or uh, through CNG, which again is difficult to transport. I actually think that the key ingredient is actually turning gas to liquids. And uh, two liquids we know we're already using in fuel uh, one is ethanol and one is methanol. And by the way, Israel just passed uh, an M15 standard, which means gasoline will be mixed by up to 15% methanol. And methanol is made from natural gas, and today we can also do ethanol, not just from corn or sugar cane, but also from natural gas. So now that becomes a transportable, easily transportable liquids, okay, that you can send around the world, and that may completely, once that starts penetrating, and that's kind of a 10-year horizon, that will completely change the transportation, oil linkage, etc. But again, it means replacing oil with natural gas products, okay, in the transportation sector, not necessarily natural gas itself. I want to add one question, okay, from the audience, and what is the role of renewable energy? How should it be factored into this energy mix? And anybody wants to comment? I want to comment. Go ahead. Um, well, um, I, I guess a, a, a couple comments. One is uh, what you said. I mean, you, you do have to uh, 
uh, think at, at this point in history, you still think about transportation and electricity a little bit differently. Um, so uh, renewables for transportation is essentially ethanol or uh, that could be derived, as you say, from various sources. Um, we've had a, frankly, a very successful program in the United States, but also controversial um, in re regards to food prices, regards to cost, et cetera. It's not easy when you're trying to break a monopoly. And, and let's be clear that oil has a monopoly over our transportation system. Um, that's good for my, you know, stocks and Exxon and whatnot. <laughs> not so good for the rest. The second, uh, on the renewable side, is that I think that people underappreciate the competitiveness of renewables in power. Um, to give you a sense, uh, you know, my firm has invested in one of the largest wind developers in the world um, and one of the largest solar developers in the world in emerging markets. Um, you don't put that kind of money to use uh, if, you're, if you're not serious about them being competitive, uh, regardless of price supports. You sometimes need regulation so that they can access the market. But you know, I, think that, I think that we're in a period now where we can move beyond subsidy. I, th I think with a, a, f a fuel mix, it's, it's never one size fits, fits all. It depends on the specific conditions and assets in a certain place and the sp specific demands of the market. Specifically in Israel, I think most of current technologies for renewables, and, and again, I emphasize the word current because there, of course, will be future developments, are not necessarily the best, uh, the best application for Israel. This is a country where it's very short on land uh, and, and, and uh, has large on gas supply, so to put more emphasis on you know, huge, large, you know, solar solar facilities in the Negev, for instance, I think might not be the best uh, choice choice for Israel. Not, so not all renewable is green. Something can be renewable and actually highly uh, polluting. I think that also we should, in our policies, we should differentiate between uh, using renewables and subsidizing renewables. Maybe the money should actually be going to laboratories. You know, send it to the Technion, send it to uh, Lawrence Livermore Lab, Weizmann Institute, to develop the new things, not necessarily to use the the old things. And I think. One way to incentivize their use, instead of subsidizing them directly, is very strict air pollution standards, which we don't have in Israel. If a, if a, if a factory in Israel can think, I'll use mazout because the oil price is low versus using local natural gas, then the policy, the air pollution standards in Israel are not, are not in place, are not, not in a good place. Well, very briefly, to pick up on what Brenda said. Uh, renewables, uh, even in electricity, but certainly in transportation, face overwhelming obstacles and challenges for them to overtake oil and fossil fuels, at least in the next couple decades. And uh, they include intermittency, uh, the ability to store power, um, and political concerns about ethanol and so forth. And this is what I meant earlier about Israel's uh, unique ability uh, to contribute to a solution. What we need, as Brenda said, are basic research and breakthroughs, batteries that can hold a lot of energy and discharge a lot of energy are absolutely crucial if we're able to just deploy more wind and solar in the grid and to get consumers to trade in their diesel or gasoline car for a, a battery car. Uh, basic research, material science, we need to find a way to shift resources away from perhaps uh, economic, but uneconomic, but mature technologies and activities and onto big scientific breakthroughs which can make those charts that I showed you obsolete. That's a ch challenge I think Israel certainly can step up to. I, before I, I conclude this session, I just want to kind of a word of caution. People kind of say, oh, I, we want to be somewhere, and they say, okay, we are here, and we're here, and the way to get there is to draw a line. The amount of infrastructure investment in oil and transportation and other is so huge. Okay, think about it, 94, 95 million barrels a day. Okay, just think about that number, okay? And most of this cannot be replaced by renewable in any near future. And in the best of circumstances, we have today one billion cars on the road. There'll be about three billion in 2050. And under the best of circumstances, 50% of them will be electric, probably more likely 20 or 25. So we're looking at all kinds of problem of size and growth and uh, et cetera, that even if we double renewables, Every year, we're not even catching up. I want to like to thank the audience, thank my fellow participants, thank you everybody for coming.